let me record. And this is uh, something I'm telling you every single semester I update this. Now, I highly suggest that you not only do these two cahoots, but you also, if you can, come to that HESI question and answer thing I'm gonna do on Sunday. Is two o'clock or three o'clock a better time for you? One o'clock. Two o'clock. Two o'clock, okay. I can do that. And you know, I will be sending that recording. I mean, a lot of you will be taking your HESIs on the day of class. So um, Sunday isn't the last of it, but you know, this is where I bring all the pieces together and make you think, okay? Um, and you'll understand when I hand you the outline and then as I sit and talk about it, okay? And here we go. This is a review. Oh, it's 2022 December, but I added some more stuff in here. What is probably the single most important influence on growth at all stages of development? If you all don't know this, I haven't taught you anything. I mean, really, how many times do I have to say these words, right? Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. You don't feed the brain, nothing else works. Nothing's going to work, whether it's fine motor, gross motor, cognition, nothing's working. Got to feel it, got to feed it. How would you initially treat a six-month-old infant diagnosed with GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease? It's a six-month-old and they're spitting up. They're losing calories. We want to keep those calories in for nutrition. A little bit of rice cereal. They say five mLs in one ounce. Oh, it's rice cereal is actually the best. They even do these on young infants. Doesn't mean it's going to be using the rice cereal if that you know GI tract is so mature, but it holds the milk down. So they're getting those calories through that milk. During assessment on a two-month-old, you notice that the head circumference has increased two inches. What are you going to do next? What does that make you look for? I mean, absolutely, we're going to be calling the doctor. And that's just part of it because you shouldn't be two inches bigger. That's a little bit much. <clears throat> Doesn't matter how many times you measure it, it's still going to be the same. We're going to look for that fontanelle. Is it bulging? Is this hydrocephalus? Because that's when you're going to start seeing these things. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? So if we're seeing everything's going the way we should, we're good. Because we can identify delays or something's wrong quickly we can institute, what do they need? Speech therapy, occupational, physical therapy. And as I said, kids are resilient. They kick up, catch up most of the time quickly. And now they're multi. And if it just received their two month set of immunizations, discharge teaching should include what? <laughs> Remember, they're giving multiples at two, four and six months. You know, sometimes it's even four injections. And if you've ever had an infant, just get their immunizations. It gets red, it's hard, it's tender. They run low-grade fevers, right? So how do we help that? Well, that pedaling, taking their legs and moving it, and you do this right after they give those immunizations. And it sort of moves it into the tissue better so it won't get that big red thing. Cool packs really well, work well. And Tylenol, acetaminophen. Um, is great and just give it like every six hours for the first day. The baby will sleep better and you'll sleep better. The head to tail direction of growth is referred to as what? C 
So head to toe is cephalocaudal. Or no proximal distal, remember the hands in and the hands go out and start looking and checking for things. I lift my head up and I walk, cephalocaudal. What is the single most important factor to consider when communicating with children? Always remember, I went to work to play. Every day I went to work, I played. And the way I played was right there on that child's developmental level. So they understood and then it broke the ice and then I could get whatever I wanted done because now these little young kids thought I was pretty cool or I had a sticker they liked or whatever. What two-year-old child pain assessment tool should the nurse use? Two years old, what do you use? So it goes to faces at preschool or ages three. So it's flack before that and for nonverbal children. Could be an 18 year old nonverbal cerebral palsy child. They're flack and it works well. A child requires ophthalmic ointment to be applied to the eyes. What teaching should the nurse give? I think the key word about this is you're putting ointment in there. Remember, most eye drops are liquid. Sometimes we put the ointment just only at bedtime, okay? Because the big thing, that medicine makes everything look blurry and it scares the crap out of children. You don't tell them. They're like, I can't see, I can't see. It's blurry. So warn them before you do it. Even adults warn them. According to Erickson, school-age children have a prolonged hospitalization should be offered what to promote industry. What does industry mean according to Erickson? Industry versus inferiority. Tasks I do well and those I can't. Very simply, Erickson. <coughs> So you're always going to let them do something. Maybe there's a, a game or a puzzle or something, but don't put it over their head. They can't accomplish it. Make it that it gives them, you know, they have to work a little bit for it, but makes them feel good when they're done because that is what? That's their industry. What is priority treatment for a child with dehydration due to profuse vomiting? Remember, dehydration in children is not good. It's extremely dangerous. It causes kidney failure, total body system failure. It's so severe. And it could be two huge vomits. I've seen it with just two. IV fluids. The key word here was they're having profuse vomiting. You can't feed a kid who's vomiting. They'll just vomit more. So it's IV fluids, NPO, antiemetics, wait, and then slowly maybe introduce some liquids. The first expected fine motor development milestones for an infant begins with what? So I always think this is when your infant hugs you for the first time, isn't it? You put your finger in that isolate and you put it in their hand and it's a reflex, reflex palmer grasp and mommy's got their first hug, okay? Remember reflex, it happens without them knowing it. Voluntary, they had to do it. They first has to see the reflex to understand that voluntary. An eight month old infant should be expected to perform which fine motor skills? <clears throat> So we know the level goes from, let's see, we know the level goes from, you know, that reflux to a voluntary, and then it goes into crude pincer, fine pincer, building blocks of two, um, 
something in a container and then blocks it too. That is the pattern which all of your exams will go off of, just like your book. So about an eight month old, they're gonna be able to grasp that rattle by themselves. And they're sort of smushing the Cheerios into their mouth at this point. It's not just one at a time. That's a little bit later on. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at how many months of age? Triple. You triple your birth weight at one year old, okay? That is what we do. We double at six months, we triple at 12 months, and I think it's around two is when you quadruple, about two and a half. But you usually are not asked to that question at two and a half. Assessing a two and a half year old toddler, you should report which finding to the provider, which one of these isn't right. Well, I just told you their birth weight is four times. So you know, that's right. When a baby is born, they're born with huge heads. By the time they're one and a half or two, their heads and their chest should be equal. If the head is still bigger, there's a problem. Something's wrong. Tumors, hydrocephalus, something, it needs to be reported. A mother of a three-month-old infant is concerned because the infant's head is flat in the back. How would you respond to that? Because we know it's back to sleep, right? That's what they recommend to prevent SIDS death. And yeah, the back of the head can become flat. In fact, a lot of times it loses a little bit of that hair in the back. And you're like, gee, you know, but there's really nothing you can do, is there? Well, they have tummy time, don't they? When they're wide awake and they're alert, you put them on tummy time and they can look around and they're so soft, those heads, they will go back to the rounded. I mean, my grandson was that flathead kid. A two month old infant has cradle cap. What should the nurse tell the parents to treat it? How do you treat that? You know, one of the key things with cradle cap, it's not going to come off in one day. You'll have some books that said just wash it. And then the key word is a fine, soft brush, fine comb, very softly. There's other books that said put little olive oil on the head. Wait till the next morning and then shampoo it. And then, you know, use the fine brush. But our book says that one. So that's the one you know. What information about introducing solid foods to their six month old infant would you offer a parent? So they're just ready to start giving foods. What is your teaching gonna include? And it's going to be at six months, it's one food at a time, and that food should be given to for four to seven days, and then you can switch to another food. Sometimes it takes a couple days for allergies to show up, and sometimes it could be vomiting, diarrhea, or just a little rash. According to Kohlberg's pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning does what or understands what? <laughs> Goldberg's all about right and wrong. And as they get older in the school age, it's knowing the consequences and they would like to play, like to do things to please. They don't like to do wrong things in that school age. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? So maybe they need to go in and get an X-ray, a CAT scan, an MRI, or maybe they need to go get one of those urine examinations because of urinary tract infections. 
you know, give them a doll. They explain to them. I mean, Child Life does this so well. They let them put stethoscopes on and gloves, and they even show them what a catheter might look like so that they're not afraid of it because it's soft. It's not hard. They think these things are going to poke them and hurt them. Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what? To encourage cooperation. Number one, you get on their level, right? That's always number one. But number two, let them play. As I said, I went to work and played every day. Let us look at the number. Push the button for me. I'm going to get this number. What number are you going to get? Try me first. All of that stuff. And they really enjoy that. It's less threatening. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child would be expected to do what? Language and cognitive development. What can they do? <clears throat> This is your preschooler. <clears throat> Remember at this point, they're just starting to learn right and wrong, but you, they, they can follow those simple commands. Put your clothes in the laundry. You know, let's go to the bathroom. We're gonna take a bath, get undressed, put your shoes here, here, put your you know, dish in the sink. They should do all that stuff. Parents are concerned her eight-month-old child's not developing like her older child. What's normal for eight months? Remember, you lift your head, you turn from your abdomen to back, back to abdomen, and then you crawl, and then you pull up, and then you sit and unsupported, and then you creep, you walk. So it is sitting unsupported at that point. Pulling to the sitting is before that, maybe six or seven months, and then they fall over. But eight months, they should be sitting there by themselves. An infant presents with signs of hunger, dehydration, and an olive-sized mass in that right upper quadrant. What would you monitor for? What do you think that is? All of size mass. Isn't that your telltale sign? And that's that little pyloric sphincter is all hypertrophic and it's hard and you can feel it through their belly. So projectile vomiting, what is treatment? Pre-op, NPO and start an IV because if you feed them, what's gonna happen? They're just gonna vomit. So rest their stomachs, give them IV fluids and give them a pacifier. A multi, which would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she's caring for. <clears throat> so this is why you have to know normal vital signs and you have to understand the principles for given digoxin, whether adults or children, some things are the same. Heart rate is too low, digoxin levels too high, the infant's vomiting, that could be dig toxicity. So very good. Potassium of four, that's good. I would give it with that. But with a heart rate of 90, nah, no. When taken an adolescent's health history, which is most important? You know, adolescents, you need to ask them, you know, many times they come in with problems that has to do with their sexuality or, you know, their genitals. So, you know, talking to an adolescent takes a little practice, but if the parents are out of that room and you've broken the ice by asking them something about them, what they like to do in their spare time, or what music were you listening to when you walked in, something. Let me tell you, they will listen. And you do not have to tell the parents what they said unless it's something that will hurt them or somebody else. A multi. A 13-year-old status post umbilical hernia repairs complaining of abdominal swelling, severe pain, and vomiting. What could have caused this? Well, think about an umbilical hernia repair. What is an umbilical hernia? What do you have to do to repair that hernia? 
you have to shove it back into place, right? So you are working with the intestines. So this could be that paralytic ileus. And because you have taken you know, this, this um, intestines, you had to push it back and manipulate, that can cause those things. Uh, paralytic ileus, or was that manipulation? And how would we treat that? Probably NPO and an NG tube and getting them up and ambulating and those sort of things. A four-year-old is reluctant to take medications. What intervention should the nurse take? Now, many times you have parents that say, my kid does just not want to take medicines. Well, go straight forward. Do you want a liquid? Do you want a pill? Do you want it in a syringe, a cup or a spoon? And, you know, let's see how you do. If you want your syringe, you suck on it here, take it, as long as they'll take it. It is the best thing to do instead of trying to force it down into them. But if you put it in and blow real quick, real hard, they'll get like, and they'll swallow. And I do that with the younger kids. Which concept reinforces the development of a sense of trust for an infant? So as you can see, there's Erickson's questions, something that you should uh, review always prior to your HESI or to your NCLEX. They love talking about these things. But when we're talking about infants, we're talking about trust versus mistrust. And trust is, I cry, I whimper, somebody comes get me, my needs are met. Mistrust is when they lay there, they're dirty, hungry, and nobody comes. And that's mistrust. An infant's NPO, unable to take breast or bottle for feedings. What's important to remember? Remember we talked about tracheoesophageal fistulas and... Um, we've talked about esophageal atresia where they can't eat, they can't, but they're normal kids. We still got to maintain their normal um, development. So it's that pacifier. Remember, how do young children, especially infants, self-soothe with their mouth, whether it's a finger, whether it's a non-nutritive sucker or pacifier, but they need that. When teaching sex education and contraceptive for adolescents, what should the nurse consider? <laughs> when you're talking about it, you can't give your opinions. So give them education, you know, what is the books and written form. You can't really say, well, you shouldn't because they're going to do what they want. They're asking for help. So um, give it to them um, orally and in written form so they can go back to refer about it. The monthly immunization for RSV is the respiratory cynical virus. One of our exams only had the generic name here. And um, it is that Pavizumab and Synergist. So that's when you need both the names. An infant with hypoplastic left hearts becoming tick, 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 taking long to eat requires rest, rest. What do you think is going on? What assessment do you need to do? What's priority now? What do you think's happening? Hypoplastic left heart, that left ventricle is not working. So that ventricle is just barely moving. There's extra stuff we have to do to make the blood go around. This is when you see this long to eat, tires easy to kipnik, always think congestive heart failure. That's auscultate the lungs. Good job, guys. When doing an admission on an infant with low grade fever and a loose cough, what information is priority for placement? You know, on admission, you know, there's a lot of rooms where two kids go in and we don't want to put an infant with an old kid, but we don't want to put a sick kid in with a, just a surgical kid, which is not sick, you know, infectious. 
And one of the things we need to understand is their immunization status. I mean, there's other things than RSV or an upper respiratory out there that are more dangerous. So immunization is very important. When administering antibiotics for a child with pharyngitis, what should you monitor? <clears throat> So any, I mean, there's a lot of distractions here, but whenever you give an antibiotic, because children get allergic reactions and they respond violently sometimes, you know, anaphylactic, always assess for that allergic reaction. Yes, we're gonna make sure that the white count is coming down, but they're feeling better. We're gonna see if it looks better, but our main priority is watching for allergic reactions, okay? When teaching a parent of a child newly diagnosed with ALL, what are early signs and symptoms of an infection? And these parents are taught, they are so immunosuppressed, they have no white counts. So this is the child that any temperature, 100.5 or higher, they need to get medical care. They're told either to go to the ER or call the doctor, but most they go to the ER. We access their ports, give IV antibiotics. It's very serious. They can go into total shock and they could die from infection because their body has nothing. They have no white cells. A three-year-old's brought to the ER with increased squeezing for the last two days and the child uses an MDI. What information is important to know with that, what you just heard? Increasing wheezing for the last two days and the child has an MDI. The kid's three years old. Did you use a spacer? Because a lot of times is they don't, they don't know about it or nobody told them. Maybe they're a new asthmatic, okay? Was there a spacer? And then show them how to use it because then they'll get all the medicine. A multi. What is included in the plan of care for a child with cystic fibrosis? Remember, cystic fibrosis many times we'll find it at birth because of the constipation. We don't see stool. But remember, these kids, we can lick their skin and it's salty. They are losing salt in their sweat like crazy. So we do never put them on low sodium diet. They need extra salt. But also they don't absorb fat. So they need high protein to make up for that. And we also need those pancreatic enzymes in order to get you know, all the nutrient that we possibly can. And those fat vitamins, we're gonna have to replace because fat's not absorbed. But again, it, it attacks the lungs like a big Petri dish. Aggressive, aggressive chest physical therapy. That's usually why they go to the ER because their lungs are with another fever. Which information is the most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? Like, what do you need to know? You've got rheumatic fever. I'm gonna do an assessment. What do I wanna know? <clears throat> Remember, rheumatic fever and acute glomerular nephritis, both are caused by pharyngitis, which probably with strep. Multi. What are some assessments that an infant would have if they were in acute respiratory distress? Now, this is an infant. I mean, supraclavicular, you know, the, this little area and the right there. When it's pulling in and out, you'll see that in older children. Um, you're going to see an elevated respiratory rate in the retractions, but in infants, Nasal flaring with a grunt on the end, you better be prepared to intubate that child. That's how serious it's like, a, eh, eh. and you're like, 
it just sounds like they're breathing hard, but it's telling you they are about to shut down completely. And it's just this little, uh, we call it a grunt. What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate with patent ductus arteriosus? Remember, this is that duct between the pulmonary artery and the aorta that's there for fetal circulation that should close by the time the baby um, is born because there's no more hormones there. So it closes, but indomethacin stops that hormone from if there's any left over there, it stops the production and without it, the PDA closes. Many times um, that one is, a lot of your premature infants are the ones with a PDA open. How do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? Everybody said this is a really hard topic. I mean, because remember you're a nurse, you are their elder. Even if you're younger, still, they don't want to talk to old people about their stuff because, you know, we're not cool. We don't know. Yeah, okay. I've never been there. Anyway, start talking about their social history, their music they like, where they're going to college. Just, just open it up. And you'll find out that these kids all of a sudden will open to you and are glad to hear. What is the greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac catheterization? Greatest risk factor. What do I always check first when I get a kid back from cardiac cath, right? I'm worried about bleeding because there are two big, the venous and the um, artery are both cannulated. And these little vessels are stretched with these big catheters and it could bleed out really quick. It's very scary. So I always check it first, so hemorrhage. Which symptoms exhibited by a three-year-old child with croup is a priority concern? So remember, croup is the tracheal oral pharyngeal area, like right in here, right? So it's going to swell up. Now, if I can't swallow secretions, it's becoming epiglottitis, which is a medical emergency, okay? So croup, not, if you can't swallow, there's a problem that needs treatment like right now. A child goes to the ER, respiratory distress, they're leaning forward, anxious and drooling. What action is a priority? Now, what is that? Isn't that the croup kid that can't swallow? Drooling? So your number one priority is respiratory, it's airway. It's get me to an area where I can do a trach or I can get intubated because this kid doesn't have an airway open hardly at all. A 10 month old status post VSD is receiving AM meds and the pulse is 88. What med should the nurse question? 10 month old 118 over 70, a little high, temp's okay. Respiratory rate is normal. We know that heart rate is low. And we know what we are concerned about when we're talking about heart rates. It is digoxin. You'll always see digoxin questions, always. When assessing a newborn infant, you notice decreased femoral pulses bilaterally. What action should the nurse do next? You just got an infant, you know, right out of mom, she came to your nursery and you're doing assessment, there's no pulses. Femoral, pedal pulses, nothing. What do you think it is and how do you diagnose that? It's coarctation of the aorta, right? So I'm going to check uh, blood pressures. And because blood's not going to the lower ones, it's a lower on the lower extremities. Because all the pressure's going up, I'm going to have higher blood pressures up above. I actually, in my, my lifetime, did diagnose one of them and right after the baby got to me. Multi-select. 
When educating adolescents about the risk for HIV and hepatitis, what would you include? <clears throat> So you should tell them they shouldn't have sex. Yeah, they're gonna listen. Uh, I don't think so, but at least condoms, right? And then of course, always hand washing. And I hope they're showering more than a week. I mean, you know, adolescents, they think they're invincible and it can't happen and it does. What discharge teaching would be needed for a toddler diagnosed with hemophilia? You have a toddler who now has hemophilia. What is hemophilia? It's when you bleed. It means you can bruise, you can get cut, you can bleed. So what is your first thing when we talk about hemophilia? It's the P of the rice price, right? Protect them, pad stuff, because they don't need to be bruising and cutting themselves in your home. And they will. A multi- Child with hemophilia has fallen and needs swollen, painful. Treatment would include what? Well, it's part of the price, right? P, protect. R is rest. I is ice. C is wrap it up. And E is elevate. Those are all the things that you would do for any injury, especially with hemophilia. Hot packs will make it bleed more and exercising will just make it bleed more. Good job. Discharge teaching for a child with cystic fibrosis about respiratory secretions should include. Mm -hmm. So, when you're talking about respiratory secretions, chest CT must be done very aggressive uh, respiratory therapy on those children. Your child with leukemia has had recent lab results with platelet counts of 10,000. Platelet counts of 10,000, what does that mean? It doesn't matter if your kid has leukemia or is in there with a cold. Platelet count of 10,000. What are you worried about? Low platelets, you're going to bleed. Because remember, platelets are part of your ble bleeding coagulopathy profile. You need platelets. It's the Band-Aid that goes over the wound that stops the bleeding. So bleeding precautions, no IM injections, right? Monitor their CBCs. It's almost like an ITP. Child starts with a nosebleed for no reason. What action should you do first? Is Kids bleeding blood everywhere. I think first of all, you got to catch the kid, calm them down and relax them, right? <laughs> because it's going to make the bleeding less if we calm them. But pressures, the thumb and the finger, 10 minutes, lead them forward. If it doesn't stop, get them to some medical care because it might need to do something else. An eight-year-old semi-conscious boy is brought to the ER with a big blood sugar, Potassium 6.8, pH 10.12. What is your priority action? All of those things are telling you what? DKA. What is your priority? <clears throat> well, number one, I want to dilute that blood as quick as I can with those blood sugars and whatnot, right? And I'm going to give a slow, regular insulin drip. Um, and it's regular insulin, and we'll be monitoring blood sugars really, really closely. Child's admitted with hypoparathyroidism. What finding would you see that needs to be reported to the healthcare provider? What is the parathyroid? What does it do? What does it monitor? If it's hypo, it's not enough. What are signs you see with not enough? It's calcium. Remember, calcium, magnesium, are those two electrolytes are all about muscles. Any questions, calcium, magnesium, 
think of muscles, whether it's the heart or just regular muscles. A two and a half year old child status post epispadius yesterday wants to play. Which would be appropriate? Well, what is an epispadius? It was done actually later because we like to do those before they're potty trained, don't we? But if they weren't, or it makes you think even that one-year-old we've done it to, we don't want to do anything that's going to cause harm to their penis. They've literally flayed it open. You know, that it's, they don't want it to be disturbed and it's a plastic closure with, you know, the foreskin. So it's very, very, take it, take really easy with it because it can bust open. So playing catch, no, sitting on a horse, rocking a bike, yeah, no, play a puzzle together. You know, play with crayons, paints, that's it. A child is cool as small respirations due to DKA. The increased respiratory rate is trying to compensate for which acid base alteration? DKA is what? And then Kuzmal respirations are going to be opposite of it. So DKA is a metabolic acidosis, and the lungs are trying with this respiratory alkalosis to compensate for it. It doesn't, it's like really severe, but it does try really hard. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? <clears throat> Give them the opportunity to express their feelings open and honestly, you know, very important. And let me tell you, some of these kids will tell you stuff that's really going to shock you. Try not to get that look of, huh? because it can happen. And I, I've, you know, heard a few things in my life and I have been shocked. In school age conflict of industry versus in inferiority, what does that industry mean? What did I tell you earlier? Remember if a school age kid is in the hospital a long time, you want to give them something to do, a task, but we want to make it something that they can solve. Yes, mastering a task, because inferiority is what they can't do. A multi. A child with a rash fever, joint inflammation, has rheumatic fever. Teaching should include what? Rheumatic fever is the strep infection. It causes heart valve damage. You cannot take heart valve damage and correct it with the long-term antibiotics. Once you have damage in the heart valve, it's there. It must be corrected in another way. Contraindication to administering the varicella vaccine to an adolescent. Well, what do you know about varicella vaccine? This is a live vaccine. When can't you give a live vaccine? Well, we know one of the things is immunosuppressed people, right? But the other one is a person who takes corticosteroids because they're immunosuppressed while on steroids, okay? It's actually even more of a med surge question um, that I've heard said, but uh, I like to um, tell you here in this class too. Early detection of our hearing impairment is critical. Which one is of primary importance? <clears throat> I was watching 60, 60 Minutes yesterday. It was all about uh, looking at the genes of dogs and um, with children, and they can make corrections because the genes are about the same and they can have new treatments. I was like, Okay, dogs, I never heard of that thing. Anyway, hearing is always with speech. If you have a problem with speech, check the hearing, number one. 
In helping a child to adapt to a hospitalization experience, the best approach is what? And I could say, especially with a toddler, get them on the same routine and they'll be happy because now they know what's coming next and they're not going to be afraid. When assessing vision on a child, the healthcare provider would use the Snellen chart at what distance? And if you can't see at that distance, what would you do? Right? We're going to let the doctor know um, because they might need glasses or surgery or something. We want the doctor to examine then. Referrals for cognitive impairment should occur when? <clears throat> you know, we're seeing that the kid is not, you know, grasping things yet. And the kid's already six months old. They're not turning over yet. What's going on here, right? We need to do it as soon as we can. As I tell you, tell you again, the earlier we catch it, give some sort of therapy. These kids, kids really do catch up really quick. How would you help encourage a preschooler to be less apprehensive when taking their vital signs? Again, preschooler ages three to five. These guys you can talk to a lot better than toddlers, right? <laughs> Let them play with the equipment. Very good. What acid base imbalance might you see with a child that's having profuse diarrhea? Vomiting, you're going to see metabolic alkalosis. Diarrhea, you're going to see metabolic acidosis. You lose alkaline from your digestive enzymes, you know, with diarrhea. And then we have stomach acid, so you lose acid with vomiting. So they're both different. A parent calls because her child was exposed to a child that now is chicken pox. When is she contagious? So there is this prodromal period, they call it, you know, when we have chicken pox. And it's two days before the rash appears. That's the prodromal. They've been exposed. They have it, but they don't have lesions yet. And that's when they're most contagious. What is the nursing priority preoperative intervention for a child with Wilms tumor? Remember my little boy who came up from Haiti with that big softball-sized tumor in his left lower quadrant? You know, he sent a card back to the unit who took care of him to tell them thank you. And of course, they called me and let me know too. So I thought that was awesome. Remember, leave the belly alone. They don't even do pre-op biopsies on this. They don't need to know if it's cancerous or not. It is, and they don't want to touch it because it will cause metastasis in the perineal cavity. A multi. An infant has not passed the meconium stool in the first 24 to 36 hours. What would you assess for? I think I've already mentioned two of these or maybe all of them already. Well, Hirschsprung's maybe a little bit of ribbon stool, but nothing. Cystic fibrosis, hypothyroidism are the two big ones that you see. Um, that, that sometimes that's when they're diagnosed. And remember, children need um, their thyroid hormones for cognition, for growth. It has all to do with growth and cognition. And Hirschsprung's will do surgery, two stage, and cystic fibrosis, fibrosis is for life and it needs to be treated. A child with sickle cell disease would most likely exhibit what signs and symptoms of a crisis? Mm. 
Remember, one of the things we need to do for our sickle cell children is to keep those vessels dilated, to keep that, those blood cells moving. So if it's cold outside, make sure they're dressed warm. If they're outside, it's warm, make sure they keep hydrated. Those two big things will eliminate a lot of sickle cell crisis because they go into crisis when their vessels get too small and blood can't flow. And pain, these poor kids cry, it's horrible to watch. When teaching the child and family about celiac disease, which one of the food items is allowed? Rice, wheat, barley, rye, oats, no, but rice that can. A child stepped on an old nail while playing outside. What action should the nurse do first? First of all, you're gonna clean it. Clean it, soap and water, put the antibiotic ointment, and then we're gonna be given the tetanus booster, okay? But first, get that area nice and clean. Even if they get tetanus, and have all of the, you know, lockjaw and all that stuff, we're still going to be treating where it entered, whether it be stepping on a nail, the hand, wherever it's at, we're still going to be taking care of that wound, okay? A six-year-old child goes to the ER due to abdominal pain, fever, and vomiting for the last day. What assessment is priority? Like, what do you need to know about this? Well, where is the pain, right? Is it right lower quadrant? Is it appendix? Is it just, you know, um, you know, like, is it uh, like an ulcer type pain? What is it? So the description is very important part of that uh, picture. A five-year-old fell off the monkey bars and is crying because of the pain in her arm. What action by the nurse is priority? So most likely she's broken a bone. Most likely it's radius and ulnar, she has monkey bars. Put your hands out first, it's most common. I wanna make sure the blood's getting there. Of course, I'm gonna assess the pain level. I'm gonna have it elevated. Yes, it's gonna get a hot pack. But priority is blood getting to the fingertips. That's number one. What is one way to help detect hypo or hyperparathyroidism in children? I think you've heard me say this quite a few times too. It's like, why do we every time these kids go in anywhere, we do a height and a weight? Because remember, thyroid is all about growth and cognition. Good job, guys. What would be the most important to report to the healthcare provider for an eight-year-old status post appendectomy with an NG tube to suction? Now, let me tell you, I've given you a lot of distractors here. Which one here worries you? Is that neutrophil count? Neutrophil count of 400, they can go into sepsis immediately. An appendectomy, they're on suction. So this was a peritonitis. This kid already has an infection and now we have no immune system. Neutrophil counts of 400 are dangerous and could lead to sepsis and these children could die, okay? I think I made your, the point on that one. A multi. Signs and symptoms of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Remember, you can aim the kid. They'll hit a garbage can, guaranteed. Remember, that is those projectile vomiting. And let me tell you, it's once you see it, you'll never forget. And remember, put your hand up underneath in the mid abdomen and you're gonna feel that olive or that little marble there. And you know for sure, treatment, NPO, 
and start an IV once the ultrasound has been done and uh, we know exactly that. I will make them NPO before they go to ultrasound. You don't want that kid vomiting again. A multi. A child with chronic kidney disease has renal osteodystrophy. What outcomes would you see? What is osteodystrophy with chronic kidney disease? Well, osteo means what? It means bone, right? Dystrophy means something's wrong with that bone. You're going to see that slow growth. It's going to be painful, could be crooked, could be short. And it also it has to do with vitamin D and calcium, okay? So low levels of vitamin D also. You suspect an infant has cryptoorchidism. How would you examine this infant? What the doctor does first thing, first visit to a male uh, baby. I'm gonna go in and we're going to look at those testicles and feel them. And if it's in a warm room, those tes te testicles will hang down as well as they could. If it's cold, it sucks up. So we want it warm. A multi. What teaching would you give parents on how a hypospadias is corrected? Epispadius, hypospadias. Hypospadias is on the ventral. And when you talk about epispadias, is on the dorsal aspect of the penis, somewhere up or somewhere bottom. Remember, this is something that can have issues with culture and because we use the foreskin. And afterwards, we put that little catheter of some sort, a stent, a catheter, a tube, um, and that tube, just stick it in the diaper. Do nothing with it, okay? And again, surgery is done under local anesthesia. You didn't look at my PowerPoint for the study guide. It is splayed open. There's no way that can be done under local anesthesia. A multi. A child with nephrotic syndrome are often given albumin and Lasix for fluid overload. What outcome would you want? So we gave albumin, which is protein, and we gave Lasix, furosemide, which is a diuretic. And because there's all that fluid, all that interstitial fluid on these children. What do you want? These kids are swollen up everywhere. We want to pull out the fluid from interstitially, put it in the uh, intravascular. We want to get it out. So you're going to have the urine output go up. The edema is going to go um, down. And of course, your blood pressure is not going to be as high because you have more fluid intravascularly. Heart don't have to pump so hard. What lab value on one of your clients makes them a priority to see first? Now you better know this one. I mean, all of those numbers aren't great, right? But which is the one that's most concerning? The neutrophil count. This kid is ready to have an infection. This kid is about to go into septic shock, okay? That is your priority child. You can live with a potassium of 3.0, um, white count of 20,000, they got a fever, they don't feel good. Glucose, okay, everybody lives with glucose, but not a neutrophil count, that's dangerous. A multi. An adolescent with a BMI of 90% is complaining of frequent urination. What tests can you anticipate the healthcare provider doing? Well, number one, what, actually, what do you think that probably is? You have an overweight adolescent. And most likely what you see with this child, probably, you know, you're, you're going into diabetes, right? So hemoglobin A1C, but you must rule out the urine, uh, urine infection. And if you're urinating a lot, those electrolytes, you're gonna be losing potassium. So don't forget about that one. What teaching should be done for an adolescent with Hodgkin's lymphoma getting chemo and radiation? What teaching? Remember Hodgkin's are those painless lymph nodes and usually from the shoulders up. Okay, non-Hodgkin's is diffuse. 
Now, we've given chemo, we do radiation. The big thing with these kids is the risk for infertility. They do have a big risk for infertility, okay? Like cystic fibrosis in males, they must have a transplant. And one year after the bilateral lung transplant, they probably can have children. A child falls in a thick bush and he's covered in prickers and complaining of severe eye pain. What is your intervention? What do you do? <clears throat> so you have prickers, there's severe eye pain. You're going to patch both of them so one is working and making the other one move. Get them to an ophthalmologist or get them to the ER quick because they need to go in and examine it. And usually what they'll do first is put some lidocaine drops in there to take the pain away so you, they can put in a dye and they can look at this sclera to see if there's any you know, stuff inside, okay? But they need to get to that um, ophthalmologist, patch both eyes. Two-year-old goes to the ER in consolable crying and painful abdomen. What findings show you this is a medical emergency? This kid is in pain. His legs are going. You know, he's crying. There's um, Usually the parents are holding these children. And if you open up their diet, you're going to see current jelly stool. This is possibly into susception. How do we treat this? Well, make them MPO, get them to ultrasound. Sometimes we have to do surgery. Sometimes we do air, embolus, uh, air enemas in the radiology department. But um, current jelly stool, maybe a little blood in it. That's what you would say, definitely into susception. When assessing a two-month-old with vomiting, what questions should you ask the parent? Because remember, we know there's different types of vomiting, right? Sometimes we vomit a little, sometimes we vomit across the room, you know, and, you know, asking them many different things will tell you, rule out what is going on here. But the forcefulness of the vomiting is your most number one question here, okay? That is your big question. Is it pyloric or is it just GERD reflux? You notice a two-year-old with con congenital heart disease, the heart rate's decreasing. What other information is important to report to the healthcare provider? So my heart rate's going down. This kid's congenital heart. What else are you going to check? I mean, literally, what do hearts do, right? They have a blood pressure. Absolutely, a blood pressure is what you want to report on. And a lot of times, listen to their lungs too. But that blood pressure is in newborn infant's blood pressure, okay? So that is very dangerous. There's no perfusion going on. What priority procedure will you anticipate for a child suspected on having Kawasaki disease? Well, what is Kawasaki? Systemic vasculitis is the words, right? We treat it with IVIG and aspirin. And what is our biggest concern with these children? A carotid artery aneurysm, right? So we're going to be doing an echocardiogram. We want to look at those coronary arteries to make sure there's no aneurysms because that would be priority to get taken care of because they could explode a multi. Why do we give aspirin therapy to a child diagnosed with Kawasaki disease? Well, why do you think we give aspirin? Not Tylenol or ibuprofen or, I mean, there's a purpose for this aspirin. What is one of the things aspirins do? It thins the blood. And also it is used for the pain or the inflammation. 
I mean, aspirin is an old fashioned drug. We don't use it in children unless Kawasaki, but it does, it decreases vascular information. They don't have pain with Kawasaki, okay? They have fever, they have a rash, they have red eyes, strawberry tongue, but it's big thing is preventing clots and decreasing that inflammation. A multi. What lab test should be monitored for a child with congenital hypothyroidism? Do you know your labs? And remember, if the T4 is up, the TSH is down. If the TSH is up, the T4 is down. For some reason, I love those questions too. TSH, T4, T3. A multi. When entering the room of a, a child, the child becomes stiff and the arms and legs start shaking. Your priority action is... <clears throat> Hmm. So that's a seizure, right? The arms and legs are stiff. What are you going to do? How do you protect safety? Safety for a child. We've studied it. We can turn them to the side. We're going to absolutely, we'll call it the response team, but we're going to also monitor it. We're going to put the side rails up, put the head of the bed down, remove all that stuff. Safety, safety, safety. Three-year-old boy waddling gait and falling is admitted for testing. What procedures would you anticipate? What do I know about waddling gait falling? This looks like muscle problems. Three-year-old boy, what do you think about that age is three to seven and boys? And with this thing, we would worry about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right? And we will diagnose that by doing an EMG. Remember, it hurts. Remember to give them something and to tell them it's going to hurt, but the pain will go away. A mother calls the clinic about her child. She was playing in the woods and has a rash that's spreading. What over-the-counter is good? Like, it gets itching. I mean, it's getting worse. What, what can I do to help her? And then I'm going to ask you, do you know that's not anaphylaxis, something going on, right? So whenever you hear it is spreading, what over the counter, you can't give that information. Get them to see somebody, okay? Because it could be just poison ivy, but who are you to say is now it's not going to go into respiratory distress, anaphylaxis, and whatever, okay? I know it's a tricky question. A mother calls the clinic and a friend of her child has ticks from playing in a field. What do you tell the mom to do? The friend of her child has ticks. What are you going to tell the mother to do? She's worried about her kid. What's the number one thing that you do when you think that there could be ticks? Number one, you're going to take their clothes off and you're going to look everywhere, examine, make sure they're not there, okay? And if you see them, you try to pull them out. And if you can't, you get medical attention to help you. What shouldn't you do to a child diagnosed with empentago? My poor little Christian. He had it so bad last year, a year ago. And it itches like crazy. So you're going to cut their fingernails, antibiotic ointments, oral antibiotics. That's the treatment. But you're not supposed to let those wounds take um, open them because what happens, it spreads. Extremely, extremely contagious. It'll spread. So let them crust up and dry up, be honey colored type, serous sort of fluid. An adolescent goes to the school nurse with complaining of ringing in the ears. What exam should you do first? Ringing in the ears. I've heard of buzzing in the ears. 
was working in the ER one night and this um, young girl came in and this buzzing, when I looked in there, it was a cockroach was inside her ear, okay? So always number one, look in the ear. It could be that, okay? It made me the now loud noise in the earpiece or whatever, but always look first. A multi. An infant is being DC'd after 14 days of vancomycin. What teaching should be included on discharge? Like, what are you concerned about with vancomycin? And does it need follow-up when they go home? Remember, vancomycin is aminoglucoside, right? Peaks and troughs, and it is kidney toxic and ototoxic. So you're going to be monitoring urine output. You're going to be monitoring if they're hearing. Those are the two big side effects. Trough levels, no, and, and SEDs, no. We don't need those. And last question, guys. Of course, the multi. When checking the labs of a lab values of a child with hypothyroidism, what lab values would you look for? Actually, it's a repeat of one just earlier. So T3, T4, we made it through. Good, good job, guys. Number three, Kayla. Good job, Kayla. Number two, Lisa. Good job, Lisa. Number one, Della. Good job, Della. Number four, EH and Jazz. All right, guys, I will be getting this recording to you as soon as I possibly can. Um, I'll be getting, if you know you did like not great on the exam today, I will let you know. Again, if you don't hear from me, you're fine, which means just go ahead, study for your essay, like you just have to pass it. Like you don't have to pull these crazy numbers out, okay? I will be doing that 2 p.m. Sunday. I'll be doing the question answers. And again, I've upped it from last semester, so there's a lot more information to make sure you get those concepts you need. And of course, it will be coming to you in a recording when I'm done. You know, guys, it's been a pleasure. What they're telling me is week 12. They want you to come back and talk to me um, at, the, at the end of the semester. It's your attendance. We're going to do it during class time. So on week 12, Monday, come to class. And, you know, if I need to pull anybody to a breakout room, we'll do that. Or we can talk openly, whatever all of you want, okay? It's your privacy. It's not mine. And I want to respect everybody's wishes, okay? We've got a little chat box over there. So we can do things privately, whatever we need to do, okay? It's like an end of semester type of, and I get to see you one more time, which is great. Tell you what you did on your, your HESIs, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll have your grades on, of course, Saturday by two o'clock. Um, again, you know what I said. If you need to like bump it up for the HESI and really need to get with me, I'm gonna let you know. So if you don't hear from me, Good job, guys. Have a good, good week, okay? Good luck next week. Kick some butt. <laughs> you said 2 p.m. on Sunday?